Hello, and welcome to the Current Science and Technology Podcast from the Museum of Science in Boston. I'm your host, Susan Heilman, and every week we bring you interviews with guest researchers and our museum staff covering science and technology in depth. My Nano Days guest right now is going to be Dr. Robert Westervelt, who is at the STC Center for Integrated Quantum Materials at Harvard University, where he is a semiconductor physicist. He's not just a regular physicist, but he likes to play with semiconductors. And we're going to be talking today a little bit about quantum materials and the importance of quantum materials, a couple different kinds and where they might be able to be used. So, Dr. Westervelt, thanks for joining me here today. Yes, thank you very much. Glad to be here. We've talked on our podcast before about a number of different carbon atomic structures. We've talked a little bit about diamond crystals. That's carbon crystals. We've talked about graphene. And we've talked a little bit about carbon nanowires. So what we're going to do today, though, is talk about three specific type of materials that are going to be useful on the atomic quantum scale. So what exactly is the importance of quantum materials? And then we'll get into the actual ones that we're talking about. Well, quantum materials are new. They've really been discovered within the past decade. And what they allow you to do is to go all the way down to one atom is the size of a memory site or a device. And furthermore, they use quantum mechanics as the basis of their operation. If you look at silicon or other conventional semiconductors, Uh, You can model the electrons as being BBs that move around according to a diffusion equation, uh, the way that gas might move through the room. Uh, And the quantum mechanics, uh, in some sense, is more of an irritation than a benefit. Uh, As things become smaller, they stop working as well as they once did. Whereas if you're going toward the atomic scale, it's better to really embrace the, the quantum effects and use quantum mechanics all the way in order to make your devices work. And so that's the the role of the center. So quantum materials could be more useful to make computers go faster or work better or store more information. Is that one of the goals? I think that's probably not the main goal and that the the technology, it's called CMOS, C-M-O-S technology that uh, is used in silicon is extremely well suited toward manipulating the bits in the, the way that they do now. Okay. And the fact that the, the speed has stopped is, I think, a fundamental thing that's happened to the computer industry that is going to change what computers are good for. Instead, when we go to the uh, atomic scale, we're making ultra-small, ultra-low power systems that work in ultra-fast. But it allows you to make an uh, entire system that you wouldn't see it if you were looking at it. Right. As opposed <laughs> to a, a, a PC that you can you know, start typing on. And uh, the kind of applications, I think, could be quite broad for signal processing, pattern recognition. Those are the kind of things that we're looking at right now. But as you go toward very small systems like that, could also be used for sensors or sensor networks. And there's uh, a lot of work now on developing systems sens- for medical sensors that are networked together that give sort of a full picture of what's happening with the patient. And so it, in a sense, it goes perpendicular to uh, a Moore's Law where you're trying to make a particular computer chip go faster and faster and faster. We're saying we'll let CMOS continue to do the computer chips, but we'll look at different things with systems and signaling and sensing in that area. Okay. Okay. That makes sense then. So it's not necessarily quantum computing we're talking about here, but just being able to work with things on a This is different. There's something called quantum computing, which has been really popular for maybe 20 or 30 years. And that's sort of an extreme case where you have a system see if I can say this in 10 words or less, where you have a system that's fully parallel in the uh, traditional sense where you have many bits operating at once, and then it's also fully parallel in the quantum mechanical sense where you have all of the particles are going by all of the possible paths all at the same time. And so if one could do that, that would be fantastic, but it's proven to be extremely difficult. Okay. So that's not necessarily what we're talking we're about We're not here. trying okay. to do that. We're trying, well, we maybe we can go in that direction. There would be nothing wrong with that. But we're trying to make things that are extremely small, the size of individual atoms. Right. And so it's quantum mechanical, all right, because right. the fact that you have an atom is sort of the beginning of quantum 
mechanics. So we're not focusing on what you call quantum computer. Okay. We're focusing on atomic electronics. Okay, great. Thank you for that distinction. So the first quantum material I wanted to talk about is diamonds, which we have talked about on this podcast before, but just to keep it all together, if you could give a brief description of what a diamond color center is, what it might be used for. Well, color centers in in crystals have been understood for many years. For example, the reason why ruby is is red is because he has chromium atoms that are stuck into the lattice, uh, and then they change the color to be red. A diamond also has color centers that have been known for a long time, and they're actually used to grade the price of diamonds. Mm. It turns out the most common one is individual nitrogen atoms, which uh, produce sort of an orange diamond. And because it's orange and people don't like that, then the price goes down. (laughs) So these are actually cheaper than uh, regular diamonds. Uh, If you uh, put in boron, then it goes blue, and people like that, so the price probably goes up. But the color centers have been known. What hadn't been known is that a color center is really just one atom. And by taking polarized light, you can actually polarize the spin on that atom. And so when you polarized it, you can either read that nitrogen then kind of equivalent as like a zero or a one. Right, that's correct. So where in atomic memory does this then fit in? Well, uh, an NV center is a one atom memory site that's just one atom. Uh, The remarkable thing is that it can save one bit of information at room temperature for over a millisecond, that is one thousandth of a second. Uh, And this is performance is comparable to what you would get in a silicon chip. Uh, And so that it means it's a fully functional memory, it's only one atom big. Basically, it's either a zero or a one. And so you put a bunch of these nitrogen centers. So you could make an array of what... uh, Walker Lankar has done is to carve up a single crystal of diamond that had a sort of dilute number of NV centers in them and into little uh, nanowires. And the nanowire kind of focuses the light in the way that uh, Christmas Angel uh, has a wand on your Christmas tree Mm -hmm. and the light comes out of the end of the wand. It's the same uh, effect. And with an array of NV centers, it's like a memory array and then you can uh, use optics to actually write individual uh, memory states and then later to read them out. Very cool. Okay, so we've got the diamonds. Uh, The next one to talk about is a a topological insulator, and this is the one that I had the the most trouble understanding. So if you could describe what that is and how you make it. I'm an experimentalist, and so I I like to think that experimentalists discover everything the theorist explains, but that's not the way it happened with topological insulators. It was theoretically discovered and then uh, experimentally verified, and uh, this was just goes back to 2005, not very long ago. What happens is that the electron spin interacts with its orbital motion in such a way that the spin is actually pinned to be perpendicular to the momentum, no matter what direction it goes. Uh, so it's imagine that you're walking around and you stick your right hand out perpendicular to your body, and then you make sure that it's always, it's always stuck out. And then no matter where you go, your right hand will be still pointing to the right. That's kind of the way that this works. So it then guides the electron around a material that it's on? Well, one way you can understand it's the words topological uh, means shape in a a, a mathematical sense. And people have a particular shape in that we all have a left hand and a right hand. And we really know which one is left and right. And there is nothing we can do about it because that's (laughs) the way we're built. So you cannot swap the left to the right. What the topological insulator do is that it will protect data as it travels around the outside of a crystal. And the way you can understand that is to go in a room where you are now to take your right hand, touch the wall, and then start walking straight ahead. And you'll find that whatever you hit, your right hand follows the wall. You'll keep going in the same direction no matter what. It's absolutely impossible to turn around. Likewise, if you uh, say if your right hand, you'll be going counterclockwise. If you put your left hand on, you'll find yourself walking clockwise around the room. And again, there's absolutely nothing you can do that would destroy that information. And uh, that's just the way that the topological insulators work. Why it's so useful is that normally, if you transmit information down a regular 
semiconductor. It hits impurities or dirt mm -hmm, or, right. or things hit it, and it goes in a different direction and the information's lost. But in a uh, tabological insulator, the information is not lost, even if you're shaking the crystal or put chips in the side of it. It just goes around it as a chip. And to make uh, a system where uh, you're moving information around with a very individual electron spins with very little energy, this is sort of an essential ingredient that's normally very difficult to achieve. The images of the walking around the room definitely helps to, to understand what these do. So moving on to the third material, the third quantum material, we're going to talk a little bit about graphene, which we have talked a lot about on this podcast, but I learned something new that graphene can do. So graphene, briefly, it's a, a basically a lattice that's one atom thick, but the lattice itself is this... Um, all these, I guess, hexagonal shapes of, of carbon, so a way that carbon is all linked together. And if you could talk a little bit about how you're working with graphene to make these different, I almost call it a quantum shape, because the material is still graphene, but you can do kind of some cool things with it. Well, the attractive part about graphene is it really is only one atom thick, and it's perfectly happy that way. And so this is silicon doesn't do this, okay. Mm. So you're in an uh, entirely different territory. Uh, another property that is that the electrons travel at a constant speed. It's, it looks like light, but they're actually electrons. And that that speed is very fast. And so that allows you to make very fast devices just because the particles are always going fast. And because the graphene is happy, only one atom thick, it also uh, permits you to think about out making really small devices that are not so many atoms wide and that will be actually a long time before we get down to a 10 atom by 10 atom right. uh, device but starting at uh, things like a tenth of a micron or so mm -hmm. is where people are and we're figuring ways to chisel up uh, graphene into smaller pieces. So how do you chisel up graphene? You were talking about using silicon one atom to basically chisel out pieces of graphene. There's a, yeah, there's a new result that uh, Wei Li Wang, uh, who was working at Harvard, found. Using a high resolution electron microscope, you can actually see the individual atoms and then in time view what happens. And they discovered that if uh, silicon atoms are on top, they actually like chisels because you have these energetic uh, electrons in the electron beam are sort of hitting with a lot of force the graphene but it's strong enough that it doesn't uh, disappear by itself but if you put in a silicon atom it acts like a chisel and the electrons are like the hammer on the chisel uh, that actually knock the, the carbon atom completely out and then it flies away and uh, they've shown that you can make a hole and then sort of widen the hole as the silicon atoms run around the, the outside making it bigger. That, that's kind of cool that I didn't realize you could use, and I guess no one knew a few years ago, that you could use silicon as a chisel, one atom of silicon as one a atom. chisel in a sheet of graphene. Right. And people are developing other techniques that are like that. It is like a bit like sculpting a piece mm -hmm. of graphene, which is a very strong material, but then you have to sculpt it at the atomic scale and figure out how to do that. But if you're talking about being able to make new or better quantum materials, this sounds like a really useful tool to be able to do that, to be able to manipulate graphene on a, on a smaller level. Sure. That's the, the aim, is to push things down to that size scale. Do you want to mention the atomic wire? Well, it's interesting. We weren't the first one with the atomic wire. This was done some years ago. But uh, looking in a high-resolution electron microscope, people have found that the carbons will actually line up one after the other so it's just like golf balls in a single row mm -hmm. and the, the interactions are so strong that that wire uh, will actually exist in the electron microscope while you're imaging it. We have movies that show it dancing around that's just sort of entertaining and so that's the ultimate small size if you like. I'm, I think it'll be quite a while before we start wiring things up with quantum wires. <laughs> with <but> carbon <laughs> wires and that, that's just amazing. So that's almost a fourth quantum material then is, is these quantum wires that you can get potentially from chiseling holes in graphene and yeah. leaving little carbon chains behind. Right. 
Well, thank you very much for explaining all these different types of quantum materials and how they can be used. I really had, you could tell in the beginning, I kind of had in my head that quantum computing was the way to go with this, but there's a lot of other applications for these many different types of quantum materials. And it really sounds like we're still at the forefront of being able to learn even what we can make on the quantum scale. So thank you very much for describing some of these uh, materials. Great, thanks very much. That's it for this week's show, but be sure to come back next time for more of the latest in science and technology. This podcast is a production of Current Science and Technology at the Museum of Science in Boston, part of the Boston community for over 175 years. For more information, visit our website at www.mos.org slash CST or email us at podcast at mos.org. Thanks for listening. Thank you.